live to tape. Welcome to Millennial Season 2, Episode 23. I'm Andrew. I'm Elisa. I'm Laura. And I'm Matt. Really loved the intro y'all did last week with the music. Making your own. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Yep. Just like that. Yep. <laughs> I had a great time in London, but uh, I missed you guys a little bit. It didn't do any podcasting that week. So, Aww. yeah, miss out on we, the fun. Aww. We missed you. Did you make we up- had. We had fun. An excuse for me last week. Usually you make up a very graphic reason for why I'm not on the show. Don't act like you didn't listen to the episode. <laughs> I think this time we just we just sat around praying for your survival over the Atlantic. Yeah, that was uh it was, honestly I I haven't been over there in 5 years. It was a little terrifying, but I it was an awesome flight and an awesome trip. I had the best time, so uh yeah, but um unfortunately we're going to start today's episode with the big news of the week. On Saturday, uh, America experienced the worst mass shooting in U.S. history. Yeah. Um, I've been kind of ruminating on this for the last few days because I knew we were going to talk about it on the show. And it's just, it's so hard to like find the words to convey the horror of what happened. I mean, we can tell you what you probably already know, which is that there was a mass shooting at um, the nightclub Pulse in Orlando. 49 were killed, uh, 53 injured. Um, the gunman was affiliated with ISIS. And I just, I find it really hard to like even convey what it is that I feel as a result of this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. More than any other shooting we've all been through we've all lived through it's it's this one seems to really affect so many people one Mm -hmm. because he specifically purposely targeted an lgbt community two because the number is just so shocking um and and three it's because we're all so tired of this happening Mm -hmm. and nothing changing right yeah because usually i like after a massacre, you know, because it happens so often now the standard is, you know, just saying some well-meaning words, you know, like how we're going to get through this together and how love wins and how love conquers all love conquers hate. And I mean, that's great. I mean, it's, it's beautiful, but I'm so fucking angry to deal with that because love doesn't win. It, it it doesn't unless we start loving each other enough to fix our own fucking problems yeah it has become I, so frequent in this country that it, oh, go ahead i was just gonna say i think the really stark kind of contrast for me is of course last june was when same-sex marriage was legalized yeah. at the federal level mm. and this is june This is what we're looking at. And there are pride celebrations happening all over the country right now. Um, Furthermore, just a few hours after this shooting, another shooter was actually apprehended on his way to L.A. Pride. Mm -hmm. And you just think about how much worse this day could have gotten if this person had not been apprehended. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, it was it was definitely scary for the West Hollywood community. I obviously heard about this, and the reports at the time indicated that he was on his way to LA Pride. It seemed like police walked that back a little bit. It wasn't totally clear what his intention was, but given what had happened hours earlier in Orlando, hearing that, I, I was I was I was thinking, do I really want to go to this? I told Mike, like I don't know if we should go to pride Mm -hmm. and elisa you were thinking about that too weren't you i was actually so after this happened i i had actually typed out a message to you and matt saying please don't go to pride yeah um and Mm -hmm. i i had my i was actually like two seconds from hitting send and then it occurred to me 
you know, we, we hear a lot, and I think it's accurate, we hear a lot about how we can't let them achieve their goal of instilling fear or letting us change our lives. And so I didn't hit send because I figured, you know, actually, maybe the exact right thing for you to do right now is to go and celebrate and be and be prideful and be mm-hmm. proud and and um and to to just be yourselves openly. Maybe this is actually the exact right time to do that. Right. But you know, my knee jerk reaction was just to to want to protect you guys. And mm-hmm. so I think there are three issues at play with this particular shooting, right? So obviously there's just homophobia is number one. Mm-hmm. Number two, of course, is the connection to ISIS and just Islamic extremism and terrorism. And number three, obviously, is the issue of gun control more generally. So you have like these three cross sections of 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 policy and and issue areas that are all like converging to make like this one awful fucking event. But like I kind of want to like parse this a little bit. So just like let's just take the first one, the homophobia. Mm-hmm. Um, first of all, I want to get your thoughts, particularly Matt and Andrew, for obvious reasons, like your thoughts or your feelings more importantly on, on how the whole thing made you feel, particularly as you were at pride. So like, we know that you went, but mm-hmm. what was the like, mood like there? I mean, yeah, I want to talk me, about uh, that. So tell me about that. So this is my third year going to the pride parade, which is on it, on the Sunday morning. So in other words, it was hours after this um, attack in Orlando and um i was expecting a more somber atmosphere but it felt just as lively as past pride parades i've been to so that surprised me the, the most notable difference was um a few of the floats in the parade had orlando signs uh the los angeles lgbt center had an actually a very big orlando sign like individual letters that they were holding up at the beginning of their float, which was really cool. Uh, Disney had some Orlando signs. So other than that, it, it was it was the same atmosphere. I was trying to tell if less people turned out because if peop- I was wondering if people were feel- fearful. I did seem to notice that certain areas of the parade route that I remember being busier were not as busy this year. So I, mm. I have to think maybe the people who decided not to come out because they were a little nervous, they were probably replaced by the people who were motivated to come out to show the terrorists, hey, screw you, we're still going to celebrate. So overall, there weren't too many differences, but I, it was definitely on everybody's minds. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good. Did you that's go, good. Matt? Um, I, act- I did not go to the parade. I, um, I, I unfortunately had to work during the parade itself, but I did get to see just a very little bit amount um, because – it's right outside my apartment and it looked, um, I mean, it looked great there. Everybody was really happy and cel- celebratory. Um, I did though celebrate, uh, the night before I-, I celebrated at pride on Saturday night, which was really kind of a surreal, ex- um, it's, it's really surreal looking back on it now because I was at a gay bar with my friends having an amazing time and everybody was having an amazing time and it was it's just hard to look back and remember how how everyone was and also consider that at the same exact time this tragedy was happening at another gay bar in Orlando and it it's really it's really hard to it's really hard to think that something like this could have happened where I was like that same situation. It actually would have even made more sense if it happened in West Hollywood because that was during our pride celebration. And, and West Hollywood is a very, is obviously very well known for having a gay community. Right. So it, like- it does. And it's also, I mean, my boyfriend, uh, Tim, he, he is from Orlando and he's He's been to Pulse many times, and he's. It's really hard to see him. Uh, go through this. He spent his 18th birthday with his best friends there. He told me what Pulse is, is like. the The club is very small. Thank God some of the people did get out, but there really wasn't. There really isn't anywhere 
really to go. They were basically just fish in a barrel. Right. I, I'd heard that. I'd heard reports of that on the news too. And speaking of, of Pulse, I, and I want you two to speak, to speak to this, um, more, but I had heard, I think it's, I think we need to talk a little bit about the significance of targeting, you know, like a gay nightclub in particular. I think that, you know, as, as someone who's straight, <clears throat> that it's difficult for, for me or for others to understand how that is such a sanctuary for, the LGBT community, you know, if you're straight, mm-hmm. you can walk down the street, you can go literally anywhere and hold hands with your boyfriend or girlfriend, or, you know, you can kiss in public and you can just be yourself very openly. And it's not even something you wake up and think about on a day to day basis. Whereas I don't, and you guys tell me, but I don't think that that's true all the time for the LGBT community where, and like nightclubs and bars, that's it's sort yeah. of they're sort of sacred because it's like the mm-hmm. one place where you can go and not have to think about that that burden you don't feel that burden of having to hide or or no. whatever do you guys agree yeah, yeah. absolutely it's, it's really i have come to really enjoy going to um gay bars uh you know in the past it it, it gave me anxiety because it was just such a foreign thing for me growing up trying to you know, suppress any, any homosexual or gay, um, tendencies because I was in the closet so much. And it, it's really, it's really a great thing to have so many different generations of, of the gay community hanging out together because I feel like each generation has gone through something completely different from the other of people who, you know, had to deal with being gay in the 80s, the 70s, the 60s. I mean, even the 90s, like it, there were so many different hurdles that each per, uh, each generation had to deal with. And, you know, it's kind of like a little monastery or, you know, saving grace that everyone gets to come in and just be themselves and get yeah. to yeah. share experiences with, you know, different you know, we're, we're basically just our own community, but we have, you know, so many different stories to tell. And, and I do yeah. think, I, I, I do think it's easy not to, to forget that. I think if you're not part of the community, it's something that you overlook, you know, a bar is a bar is a bar, right? Mm-hmm. You just go out and you get, you get shut faced and like, that's the end of it. Yeah. I think, it, I think it carries much more significance if you're gay. It de- it depends on the area that you grow up into or you live into. I think Los Angeles, a lot of gay people can go to any bar and, and be accepted. Orlando, uh, not totally sure how accepting it is there in general, but I, I, I imagine it's not as accepting generally as Los Angeles is. Uh, but yeah, you know, I was actually in a gay club called Heaven in London on my final night there. And... I, after this shooting, I was just thinking back to that because I also learned on this London trip that that you can't even carry a knife in England. Like it's illegal to do that. It is so safe over there. <laughs> you can't carry a gun. You can't carry a knife. Like I I I had never felt safer being at a gay club over there before because it's just like and and I and you still have to go through security, so there's still that level of protection as well. But. Mm-hmm. Um, after, after this horrific shooting in Orlando, all I could think about was, damn, like I was so lucky to be, be in a club over in London the other day where you can't really bring in any weapons whatsoever. Yeah. So I, I think we're going to talk about the, the gun control thing in a second, but, but before that, my, my last question for you guys is what do you, how do you feel about these reports that the gunman may himself have been gay? There's been a few people who've come forward saying mm-hmm. that they recognize the gunman from, grinder and a few other apps and even yeah. from pulse i think people were yeah. saying that he had gone People's, to that club yeah he they said he he frequents i think they said like three times a week or something and they've seen him there a few times for yeah. sure and I, go ahead i think ahead. they i think he um if it's true he obviously grappled uh very he had a hard time grappling with his sexuality and for some reason, he came to the conclusion that the only way out was to kill gay people. And I guess he assumed he would meet the same fate by the time he was done 
uh, with his attack there. So um, it, it's it, it definitely changes this story a lot. It, it's not even though he did pledge to ISIS, it definitely affects the story a lot that he also was struggling, clearly struggling with his own sexuality. Like there's there's no way he wasn't given what he did. Um, I just wanted to make sure to mention one point that I've seen a lot of people bringing up, um, particularly Latinos and Latinas, that. Um, this was actually Latin night at Pulse, and um, a large number of the victims were um, people who identified as either Hispanic or Latino or Latina. Mm-hmm. Um, and kind of going back to the point that the three of you were just discussing about the, the club being a really safe place. Um, I, not having gone through this myself, I can't speak to it personally, but I have heard that being both a member of a minority community as well as being gay can be incredibly challenging. And those aren't even (laughs) the right words to describe it. So I think that it just adds another element of how this safe space, this kind of haven was really taken away from people Mm -hmm. that night. Yeah. um, I think it was John Oliver said uh, something on his last episode where he said that uh, a a gay nightclub had a Latino night and how that alone just shows how, you know, great America is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, so yeah, I no, I, I wanted to I wanted to move quickly just into into the discussion about gun control, because I think that's also what's been on everybody's minds for obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and we talk about this a lot. We talk about this so much on the show. Actually, the news just reported that this was the 15th, 1-5, the 15th time President Obama has had to make remarks about mass shooting in the United States. Um, that's, that's insane. Um, so I, I guess, you know, what's, well, how, how does gun control factor into this or does it? Because, it, you know, I, you can, there's some people who are saying that that's not the real issue at play here. That the real issue at play here is all of the homophobia and the the cultural aspects of this, not necessarily the the legal aspects of this. What do you think? There are multiple issues at play here, but the the mm-hmm. big thing about gun control this time is that this guy was on a watch list. He was investigated by the FBI twice. For and he what? Was, well, do we know? Was, uh, I don't, for I don't know uh, know for sus- uh, suspect of uh, terrorism. So, so he was on a, he was on a watch list anyway, and he could still buy a gun. And the GOP blocked a bill, I believe it was in December, that would have prevented this type of thing. That, um, he, he purchased his gun, guns only a couple of weeks ago. So wait, you're telling me that he was on an FBI, he'd been investigated by the FBI for being a potential terrorist. Right. Just however long ago, a few weeks, a few months ago. And he bought a gun within he, a few months of being investigated. Mm-hmm. No, he okay. he bought the guns within the past couple of weeks. Yeah. He had been on the watch list for much longer than that. He, yeah, <laughs> the FBI questioned him twice for ties to terrorism. He he beat his wife, and it is on record um, that he was abusive to his wife. He had been reported many times by his employer as being, quote, homophobic and unhinged. And mm-hmm. none of these things disqualified him from buying a gun that shoots 45 rounds a minute. That's I, I I don't understand. We have sacrificed so much of our of our civil liberties to allow the intelligence community to do exactly that mm-hmm. to invent to 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 find terrorists to investigate them and to put people on watch lists. What good is all of that? If they can still buy firearms and weapons anyway. Yeah. I don't Obama, understand. Obama did talk about this on a previous town hall. He, um, he said that, um, he said that because of, um, the NRA's, uh, blocking bill, he, uh, Obama can't, he is, he cannot prohibit suspected terrorists from buying a gun. Right. So even if they're on the list, the, he, it is, his hands are tied. He cannot prohibit. So, yeah, I was, I was, right. actually, I was actually watching this clip earlier today. I'm trying to find it right now, but he, 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 he essentially predicted that this was going to happen two weeks ago. 
That's crazy. Yeah. How, 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 okay. I'm sorry, Laura, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, he can't buy, you know, or he can buy a gun, excuse me, but they're going to fucking make sure he can't get on a plane. Right. It, right. It feels so he- like, it feels like this country is stuck reacting to like a decade in the past. Like, guess what, guys? They're not going to try and fly planes into buildings anymore, probably. I mean, I'm not saying never, but terrorists are now going to go after our soft targets because that's it's the path of least resistance. Yeah. And And one of our soft targets is our gun laws. (laughs) Right. And these attacks are not from foreigners, foreignist extremists. These are people who are U.S. citizens. This... This shooter, I don't even know if we want to mention his name, but he nope. was born in New York. Right. Very close to where Trump was born. <laughs> if that means can, anything. <laughs> can, well, well, it means something because Trump was saying, thank, he was, he was patting himself on the back for being right, for saying we should have banned Muslims. I told you, but that wouldn't have done anything in this case. Yeah. Cause this no, guy was born in America. Yeah. He would have been sent back to Schenectady. Can, can, right. Can I play this Obama clip real quick? Sure, yeah, I think course. I have it here. I'm winging it, so bear with me. I, I just came from a meeting today yep. in the Situation Room in which I've got people who we know have been on ISIL websites, living here in the United States, U.S. citizens, and we're allowed to put them on the no-fly list when it comes to airlines, but because of the National Rifle Association... I cannot prohibit those people from buying a gun. This is somebody who is a known ISIL sympathizer. And if he wants to walk in to a gun store or a gun show right now and buy as much, as many weapons as ammo as, as he can, nothing's prohibiting him from doing that, even though the FBI Knows who that person is. So, sir, I, I Ob- just Ob- Obama said that two weeks ago. Wow. It's eerie. It's eerie. Yeah. Wow. This explains, actually, I just saw today. So um, Congress held a moment of silence today um, for the victims of the Orlando shooting. And during the moment of silence, which, of course, was being led in the House of Representatives, which is led by the Republicans, during the moment of silence, the Democrats started speaking up. And saying, no, no moment of silence. We want action. We want a bill. And they started screaming out to the Republican leadership, where's the bill? Where's the bill? Mm. Um, This explains, I I wasn't 100% sure if they were referencing a specific bill. But I think, you know, in the context of Obama's remarks, clearly they were. They were referencing, you know, the bill that Obama's talking about there. That's insane. Yeah, so it's crazy. Hopefully that is going to change. Hopefully people on terror watch lists can no longer get guns. I, I'm th- within the next few months. I would like to see Congress do something about that. If they don't mm-hmm. after this, that is actually so insane. Although Guys, there have been so many insane things happening here's, recently. Here's the thing. <laughs> How, when was Sandy Hook? That was 2012. Mm-hmm. So it's three and a half years ago. Um, we this country watched little children get assassinated and was like fuck you don't take our guns yeah mm-hmm. not so only, i, not I only don't that, know they how, also thought it was it was it was staged right like i just don't know how realistic it is to think that we're going to get any kind of legal resolution anytime soon and even if we do here's what scares me there are enough guns in this country for a- every man, woman, and child. So even if you pass a bunch of laws, we're still going to have problems. I'm not saying that we shouldn't pass laws. I really hate that logic, that idea that, well, uh, the criminals are still going to get guns and we're still going to have a lot of guns, so we just shouldn't do anything about it. But I also just wonder like, how much we're going to get as a result of this. And it's just becoming more and more clear to me that the Republican leadership does not give a fuck. I'm yeah. so fucking it's... sick and tired of that excuse saying, well, if everybody had a gun, like this wouldn't have happened. Oh, well, yeah. so that's Scare clearly me. not the that's... case. A couple, yeah. of num- a couple of numbers that throw out really quickly, just to Laura's point, 
Um, the United States has roughly four and a, the Americans rather represent roughly four and a half percent of the global population, but we have 52 percent, a little over half of the world's guns, civilian owned guns. And we are home to one third of mass shootings. I don't think that's a coincidence. No. And I also want to emphasize for probably the 10 millionth time that no, that the, the bills that are trying to be passed are not actually taking away anyone's guns. They're just trying to, to put in more safeguards, very obvious common sense safeguards before you can purchase one. Earlier right. today, like my favorite news outlet, Vox, did an investigative report. They went out to a gun, to a, um, a gun store and they bought the exact same gun that was used by the Orlando shooter. It took them seven minutes. Mm-hmm. From the minute that they walked into the building and walked out with that gun and all the ammo in the world took them seven minutes. Then just to see, just for comparison's sake, they went to a neighboring uh, hospital to be checked out. And the paperwork to be admitted to the hospital took 12 minutes. And so their point was it takes less time to to buy um, a, a gun of this caliber, not just a handgun, but like a mass killing machine. And it takes less time to buy one. Yeah, it takes less time to buy that than it does to fill out paperwork at a doctor's office. Yeah. Just well, there's mm-hmm. other stu- stupid things like that, too, like like learning to drive a car. Or uh, or buying medicine, they limit how much Sudafed you can purchase. Yeah, at the drugstore, it's it's really really crazy, and it all comes back to the NRA. Um, this story is obviously still developing in many ways. The, the new information about the shooter, um, gun control. Obama's been going in. Uh, Trump Trump has been Trump has been making a fool of himself as well. He. He thanked everyone for congratulating him on calling this, even though the Muslim ban wouldn't have worked, like I said earlier. Um, they, he also said they, they can't ban all assault rifles because there are millions out there, <laughs> which I thought was funny because he, he, he wants to kick millions of illegal immigrants out, but he can't kick out millions of guns. That right. doesn't really make Andrew. sense. Nuance when it's convenient. <laughs> ah, I see. Ah, the, that magic and, word. And Trump yeah. also mentioned that thing that I think Matt just mentioned. If if he was like, if people in the room had guns, you wouldn't have had the same tragedy. Yeah. Which, and with, oh, yeah. You know, with that logic too, that what if what if people don't want to have a gun? Does that mean that it's their fault they got killed because they didn't have a gun with them? Yeah, you know what and, and, I think sounds like a really good idea. A bunch of semi-intoxicated people in a dark room with loud thumping music firing weapons. Exactly. This would not... Does, has he been to a nightclub before, like at one of his hotels? He must know that people, a bunch of people shooting in a dark nightclub is probably not going to turn out very well. Right. But you know what? A lot of people agree with him on this. My when uh, I can't remember which shooting it was, but I wrote something on Facebook, and my, my dumb Republican uncle was... Uh, <laughs> was saying, Andrew, you see, everybody has to uh, get a... It was San Bernardino. He was like, Andrew, you see, everybody has to get a, have a gun so that um, they can buy time before our men and women in service get to the scene. So that's, a, that's another popular argument, that everybody needs guns so they can hold off the enemy until the police get there. But yeah, and it's so st- stupid. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just so stupid. Hopefully one day... Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I feel like if you if you truly believe, and I'm not talking to all gun owners or even all gun enthusiasts, but I am talking to the people, and I doubt any of them listen to this show, um, but to the people who staunchly hold on to the gun laws as they are right now and who scream things like, you can't change the Second Amendment. By the way, you can. It's an amendment. Um Ask yourself what that's really worth. I've seen people make the argument that, well, we can't stop people who are on the terror watch list from buying guns because some people end up on that list by mistake. I'm sorry. I care a whole fuck of a lot more about the people who could potentially die than I care about somebody ending up on a, on a list due to a clerical error. Right. Okay, I mean, one our- of those things is reversible. The other is not. 
Yeah. Like our well yeah. said. Pretty much every public place I go to now, I'm incredibly aware of where my exits are. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of fucked up. Like yeah. the first thing I think of when I walk in somewhere is like, okay, where are the exits? How would I get out if something happened? Yeah, I do that at the movie theaters now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, movie theater for me too. Yeah. Hopefully one day we as a nation can find the uh political will to reject mass shootings per day as yeah, the we'll price see. of freedom. I'm not feeling we, optimistic. Because there's really no shortage of like troubled people. Like most of the sh- most of the previous like attackers were in their 20s. Like there's no shortage of these people out there and whether they're radicalized by ISIS, homophobia, white supreme supremacy, national uh, nationalism or just yeah, even a dislike of movies. Like we're just making it far too fucking easy for their derangement to kill us. Well, the last point I wanted to touch on, the last, you know, number three of the issues that are at play here is the the fact that he pledged himself to ISIS and the sort of Islamophobia that this event uh, is probably going to inevitably breed and that Trump is already sort of capitalizing on. Oh, yeah. And I think we could talk ourselves blue in the face about this. The only thing I think I really want to say is – I personally, I don't deny that religion in general, not is not Islam, but just organized religion as a whole, in my personal opinion, does have some very problematic views, does have a very problematic relationship historically with the gay community. I don't think that is at all specific to Islam. I just think that's organized religion. That's number one. Number two, though, I think that this really isn't For every person who is some crazed, fucked up, you know, extremist of any stripe, you know, there are thousands who are just normal, cool, chill people who are just practicing their faith peacefully. And I think that it's super, super critical that we look around at our friends and communities and we identify those people, that we think of those people and not and not, you know, obviously paint everybody with the same stripe. And lastly, If we really want to stand any shot at defeating extremism, um, you know, Muslims are our best bet. They're the ones who are more Muslims are slaughtered by extremists and by terrorists than any other people. They're the ones who are dealing with this more than anybody else. So they're they're our allies, not our enemies. And they're the ones who have the power to actually change something. You know, they're the ones who are living this every day. Um, so I would just say it's not even it's not even in our own interest to ostracize Muslims um, because God, no. they're mm-hmm. they're 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 our allies in this. They are our only chance at actually defeating extremism. And they know better than anybody what what this kind of bullshit is like. It comes down I'm, to normalizing these communities, whether it's normalizing Islam, normalizing LGBT people, normalizing uh african-american people because racists live in these bubbles where they see nothing but an example here in america white people uh i consider my dad a little racist actually and he lives in this white suburban bubble and doesn't doesn't see out of it and it's really sad and it's all his fault and you try to you try to open his eyes but he he can't and chooses not to even when i was over in london i just i i i forgot how diverse it is over there it is amazingly diverse over there and um yeah so whether it's we've had this discussion before about normalizing for example gay people on television these communities need to be normalized so people realize that they are just like them just like we're boring just like them Mm -hmm. yeah i would also like to point out that While it's very easy in these particular instances to look at individual fundamentalists as though they are representative of an entire religion or an entire culture, let us not forget the culture that has basically been painting a target on the LGBT community for the last how many years in this country? Countless. Christians, and not all Christians, of course, you know, the fundamentalist ones I'm talking about, 
have gone out of their way to try and demonize the gay community and deny them their rights. So I think they get to carry some of the blame too. You inspire that kind of hatred. Don't be surprised when people act on it. Mm -hmm. Just like you wouldn't say the Westboro Baptist church is very representative of, of Christian community. I don't think it's fair, obviously to look at instances like this and say, Oh yeah, well, right. That's just, that's Islam for you. Exactly. But no, I, these, 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 these nut bags are exploiting Islam. In my opinion, they're taking something that is otherwise practiced peacefully by millions of people and saying, Hey, this is a great, here's a great idea. Let's, let's manipulate the shit out of this for my own agenda. That's in my, that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do something different this week. Uh, we, uh, in our Facebook group, we reached out to our LGBTQ listeners. We wanted to get their thoughts on all this and we asked them to prepare a remark or two. So we are going to call them live. Hello. Hi, Mark. Hey, how are you? Hey, it's Elisa Millennial here. How are you doing? <laughs> Not too bad. How are you? Okay, good. Um, uh, thank you for being part of this. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we, there's, we don't expect anything specific from you. We really just want to hear your thoughts, your feelings, anything that you want to say. This is your moment. Um, so, so just, yeah, tell us how, tell us what you're going through and how, what you've been thinking the past couple of days. Um, I guess where to start. Um, I guess the first thing was that, uh, you know, I've always been kind of, um, you know, I've, I'm a little older than a lot of you guys. I'm not a millennial. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. You're a millennial to us. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I haven't really been out and, you know, and proud and gay and, you know, and all that stuff. Um, but recently I've been getting a little more into it. And Saturday I went to um, Gay Pride and I actually worked it. Um, my oh. company, um, I recently joined their um it's called one Marriott, which, you know, means, you know, obviously everybody's included. Uh, and I just had a great time. I've met so many people and I was handing out these bracelets, uh, that Marriott's promoting, um, love travels, you know, and their gay website. And I just, just left there on such a high, you know, just being myself, seeing everybody else being themselves, you know, seeing young kids with their moms walking through, you know, in a place that they felt, you know, safe seeing, you know, older people walking hand in hand that have obviously probably been together for years. It was just, you just saw everything. It was just, everybody was happy and, and everything. And then to wake up the next morning and have this happen. And it really just, just crushed me for a couple of days. It's just, because for me, it wasn't as much of a quote unquote terrorist act is I think the guy was gay. Uh, I've read some multiple stuff where the guy had been coming to that club for years. Mm -hmm. And I, I definitely, I don't know if you guys have talked about this part yet. And there's also people that he went to college with who said that, you know, he had asked them out. And so I, I think this is more of him not being able to handle that he was gay. Mm -hmm. And obviously his religion, not accepting that, you know, that you yeah. can be gay mm -hmm. and that he, um, unlike most people that can't handle that and get depressed, you know, that he might sadly kill themselves, you know, he, he went the other take way. Take people down with him. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we wish, you know, he had killed himself instead of 49 people. Right. Um, but that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Yeah. I, I think. Yeah. Once we started to keep hearing all this information um, coming out about the fact that he was, you know, it would be one thing if he'd only gone a couple of times in the last month to quote unquote scout it out. But the people that work there have said that he'd been coming for years. Mm -hmm. That's not someone who's scouting out a location. No. Who eventually, <laughs> that's someone who's gay and just, you know, between his religion and the fact that you also heard that he just was kind of an awkward person. So, yeah. you know, in this whole Miami thing, he's probably mad when he went to Miami that, you know, he wasn't the one hooking up. He was probably, right. you know, was hitting on some guy 
and got mad that that guy was kissing someone else. And that pissed him off. And he came home angry. Yep. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, it does make sense. I, 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 I agree with you, Mark. I think, yeah, that, uh, I mean, like he, from the information that we're slowly getting, it seemed like he was like a closeted um, gay man. And like you said, with uh, his religion and uh, his life, it seemed like he was just, you know, festering and hating himself. And that's probably what led to him also just hating the gay community itself. Yeah. Because, yeah. and then look what, and they were comfortable see what happened. with themselves and he wasn't, mm-hmm. you know. It right. also makes sense why he beat his wife and everything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But he was frustrated Mark. the fact that he had to get married. <laughs> mm-hmm. Thank you so much for no problem. For Thank us you for this. calling. No, no, no I, we really do. We really do appreciate. It. We know this is. I mean, it's it's been fucking excruciating, you know, on on the whole country to watch, but I think particularly for mm. the the gay community. So I appreciate you you coming on and talking about it. Um, yeah, yeah and, if, and, and good on you for helping out at Pride over the weekend that's yeah. awesome yeah I, yeah you know i i wish it was more than once a year now after saturday <laughs> night it was just such a great time yeah you know, so. yeah good all right well have a good night mark thanks mark all right thank you bye mark bye. Bye. bye bye mark mark by the way long time fan of the show so yeah appreciate him calling in yeah. all right our next caller is sarah our friend sarah another long time listener of the show hello Hey, Sarah, Sarah. it's Elisa. Hey. hey. How are you? Good, how are you? We're doing okay. Um hanging in there. We're hanging in there. We're having a we're having yeah. a, a dark conversation, but you know, a necessary one. And, you know, as you know, we wanted to get your thoughts on it. So um, you know, like I said, we're not expecting anything in particular. Just what are what have you been going through? What are your thoughts and feelings about, you know, the past few days? Yeah, I mean, I think the first second that I was alone after it happened, I started thinking about every queer person that I know and love, including myself and how much they just deserve to live. Mm-hmm. And that that was such a simple thought. And then I started thinking of all the reasons why and quote unquote their benefit to society, which was really easy. I know a lot of the fast queer people, but I realized that that isn't the point, even if every single victim was a worthless, unintelligent idiot that was going to vote for Trump. They still deserve to live. And who don't recognize how at risk queer people are. And right. it is just, it's really sickening. And just seeing everything on Facebook, and I have kept seeing everyone changing their profile pictures and talking about it. And erasing different parts and not recognizing holistically how it was about queer people of color and it was about queer people in general and their safe spaces. And I just kept thinking that of how angry I was and how much if you challenge about queer rights before this point, I want you to take a fucking seat and mm-hmm. and not yeah. talk at all. And I shouldn't have to manage my anger or think about how I'm representing the queer people because I'm not a tokenized representative, but I'm treated as one every second that I live. And Mm -hmm. it makes it really hard to grieve, even to the people that, like, I know and love and love me. And it just, it's really, really hard. And I hope that everyone that has queer people in their life checks in on them and let them know if they have the space to be angry, that they don't have to have this front. They don't have to be quiet about it. We're allowed to be angry. We're allowed to be sad. We're allowed to be hurt. We're allowed to talk. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what would you say? I mean, so this, this raises a good question. Like, you know, if we want to be allies of the LGBTQ community, what would you tell us to do? What would you say is one of the best things that we could do to be helpful I think remembering that ally is a verb that you're given. You don't call yourself an ally. A queer person calls you an ally or someone, a person of color calls you an ally of different races, things like that. You have to educate yourself about the statistics and the history, but remember that we're not statistics and we're not history. Mm -hmm. We're people that are more than that, but that is still a part of what you need to know. And you can't just 
step in at the last moment and be the hero at the last mile of the race. Because queer rights have been going on for a long time. And we've mm-hmm. had a lot of different fights. And if you're going to be upset about this, you have to also be upset about everything else. If you're upset about all of the queer violations outside of America, all of the queer violations that have happened to generations before us, and just don't read the Wikipedia articles about it, like do full research and make sure that you remember that you don't have to talk over and you shouldn't talk over. You have to lift the voices of the people around you, particularly queer people of color right now. Mm. Yeah, good point. Yeah, Excellent. We're, mm-hmm. thank you for that, Sarah. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. This yeah, awesome. awesome. No problem. I really appreciate you guys for doing this because this is exactly what you should do if you're an ally. Heck yeah. <laughs> thank you. Heck yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Sarah. Have a good night. Thank you. I love thank you, Sarah. You. <laughs> love you. Bye. Bye. Love you too. Bye. All right. I'm an ally. Are you? She's yeah. Like, she's just such an incredible person she guys is. She, she is, is. She's we've known her for smart. a really really long time and she's just yeah a I'm not gonna lie. Human being. i saw her name pop up in the email and i definitely chose her in particular <laughs> <laughs> not, not not just because like we we love her so much because she's very well spoken on these issues and i trust her opinion so wholeheartedly yeah um, and when i hope this doesn't come off wrong but when i was listening to her i was like wow she's really grown up <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, I can hear the adult in her now, yeah, in her voice and the way she speaks. I thought the same thing, but kind of more hatred towards myself. Like, fuck, because you haven't grown up. I have not. <laughs> yeah. All right. Our next person is Jerry. Hello. Hey, Jerry. It's Elisa, millennial. How are you? Oh, wow, this is crazy. Um, okay, how are you all doing? <laughs> Good. 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 How are you in there? Uh, did, you n- oh, did you not expect us? <laughs> I mean, I completely did, but like, you're here. Hi. <laughs> we're here. <laughs> we're right here. We're sitting down right next to you. <laughs> well, we're more concerned. Right. We're way more concerned with, with how you're doing. Um, so while, tell us tell us about that. We just want to hear from you. Anything that you want to say or get off your chest, tell us tell us how you're doing. Okay, I am okay for the most part. I think mostly it's very confusing because, like, a black gay man in Florida, it's really hard to navigate waters down here of, like, where you are and aren't accepted. So on one hand, I am, let's see, I'm sort of, like, very infuriated mostly by, like, how the media is portraying this. They're displaying, like, a narrative that this is all about terrorism when it's, I mean... How do I explain? I think that the media has a responsibility to the people to tell the whole story. In every interview I have seen today, yesterday, and the day before has fitted to fit the narrative of jihad terrorism, Mm -hmm. which isn't from what I've heard from the people that I've spoke to that were there that night, isn't necessarily what everything was about. I've also heard that there was a second shooter from my friend that was there, which hasn't been reported by anyone. Um, I know that a lead FBI investigator has said that this is not about homophobia, which if you do a, a gay club shooting um, during Pride Week, I would say this has a lot to do about homophobia. Yeah. Um, I am just very, very confused. It's not the safest place to be as a gay black man living in Florida. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really don't see myself living here much longer after this. Really? Ask you, because we mentioned this earlier. What, what do you think of Orlando in particular in, for the gay community? Is it Does it feel safer I, there, do you think? Orlando is so liberal. It's so much fun. You can Orlando is one of the few places I would feel safe holding my boyfriend's hand in public mm. before this past weekend. Like, whether it be at a theme park, at any hotel down the street, that's fine. I live in Fort Lauderdale, which is about three hours away. Mm-hmm. That is certainly not the case here. Yeah. Yeah, they it's what they 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 say in Florida like the more north you get the more south it is. Oh, definitely. Once you get around Gainesville, which is KKK territory until about like Tallahassee. Mm-hmm. I feel like people are going to say that but it's sort of true. Right. No, did you said that you knew someone who was at the nightclub when it happened? 
Yes. Okay. He um, texted me his full story, and I guess I'll read it to you guys. He said, he said, well, I asked him how he was doing after everything happened because I hadn't heard from him in a few hours, and he said, I'm doing well. Uh, I went to a friend's place to hang out last night when we decided to head to Pulse. As we turned to walk in through the doors, we heard the shooting, and instantly my friends and I dropped to the ground and started crawling out to the patio. I was trapped in a corridor as people ahead of us tried to break through a wooden fence. I honestly just got to the ground and started running as fast as I can. I ran for 17 minutes and didn't look back and took an Uber home. Um, there was someone blocking the door, the second door from the outside, but whoever that was, we pushed over him and all escaped through a fence. So yeah. uh, another thing is that Jesus, the God. media God. keeps, isn't reporting that like someone from the back was trying to hold the door closed so more people could be shot. What? Oh my what? God. I had not, you're right, I hadn't heard I that. haven't heard anything about this. <laughs> the, a lot of people that were at the club that night, I say that everyone was trying to leave through the back door because the shooter obviously came through the front and that door was completely shut like locked and that's usually an emergency exit that's open i've been to that club a few times Mm -hmm. oh my god scary 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 listen um can i i want to ask one one quick question if i may Mm -hmm. you you i know this is sort of going all over the place um well first of all i hope your friend you know is is doing okay as as well as can be expected i i can't even imagine like it's traumatizing just to listen to you know it really is. Li- and he's been back and forth in the hospital because his friend was actually grazed with a bullet or i believe <sighs> injured in some way i didn't want to ask too many details about it because it was still very fresh yeah um i believe he was discharged today uh i haven't actually checked which i should probably do after this call well hopefully he's okay I mean, so you were saying, I hope so too. Like, it's so crazy. You were saying, I want, I wanted to, add, I want, because I didn't want to cut this point off. I think it's an important one given that at Pulse it was, you know, it was Latin night. You know, how you were saying mm-hmm. how difficult it is to sort of navigate, um, to sort of navigate the community down there in Florida as, you know, a, a gay black man. How, how do you? I mean, how, where do you start? What's it, what's that like? It's usually through, like, a lot of social networking that you find out what's happening here. And people just really stay to themselves and to the cities. Um, Like, Wilton Manors down here is a large gay population that a lot of people like to hang out um, at, too, for inclusion. Other than that, a lot of us really just go to, like, Pride and keep to ourselves. There are clubs, but they're few and far between. Nothing like probably anywhere else. It's really... Florida is really made for the straight person. Mm-hmm. Mm. And and theme parks. I mean And theme parks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well except for Miami. Miami is like its own little world. Yeah, Miami is completely separate. I would say I don't think I would be exactly comfortable in Miami being myself either, unless Sizzle, which is Miami's pride happening. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, Jerry, thank you for sharing this information with us. Thank you. Thank you, you so much. Thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. I, can't, no I just want to say that's... one quick thing. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Of course. Sure. There are, I think, well, I guess I'll just speak like as a black gay man and someone who is a part of several other movements. Hold on. Let me silence that. As a part of someone that's a part of several other movements, it was very disappointing to see those same people that had asked me to protest for things in the past. Turn their turn a complete blind eye to this. It went from like, oh, uh, Black Lives Matter, this, that, and the third. Let's all protest. Let's all be equal to. Well, I ain't down with that gay shit. And mm-hmm. that I think hurt me the most. It's like you asked me to march for this person and that person, but when I'd turn, you like this is what is going on, and I've. I just want everyone to realize that even if you're in a marginalized group, you do possess some sort of privilege. Mm -hmm. For me, I just want a lot of male heterosexual Americans to know that movement stop when they don't involve you. Yeah. And 
Yeah. You said I, movements don't stop when they don't, and just because they don't involve you. Right. Okay. Right. And I, I feel as though, like, when it comes to things, especially like as a black person, when it comes to things like police brutality and stuff, the main people that go up are the homosexuals and the black women. Mm-hmm. When Sandra Bland died, I went to that rally. There were probably a dozen black men and 200 black women. There needs to be more representation from all sides of the field in order for anything to be like done about this. It's really unfortunate that this, like nothing will come of this. We'll forget about this in two months and things will still stay the same. And what sucks is this is all proven Donald Trump's point. Like this probably sealed his presidency. It certainly helped him. I hope it didn't seal it, but yeah, it certainly uh, is new, is new stuff for him to work with, which is scary to think about. Yeah. So So disheartening. Yeah. Yeah. Jerry, Jerry, listen, particularly being down there in Florida, um, we really, really appreciate you, you know, lending your voice to all this. And um, please, like, I don't even know when, when I say stay safe, I don't even know what I mean by that anymore, but I hope that you are safe and I hope you know that we love you very much and we hope to hear from you again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I love you guys too. I'm such a, like a long time fan. This is awesome. Although it happened under these circumstances, I'm so glad I got to talk to you guys. Yeah. We are too. We're, We're glad, so to, glad talk to, you too. to talk to you. You mentioned you may leave Florida. Keep us posted. Email us. Let us know. We, we'd like to hear what, what you do. If you go through with Take that. us on the road oh, with you. Yeah. Come to Los Angeles. I definitely will. We can I, all go to uh, Canada, guys. <laughs> oh, Just saying. Yeah, I, guess well, I, I guess will guess be to Houston to. in September for the Formation World Tour. I'll be there in September. Oh, so oh, I might have nice. so much fun. And I went in Miami. Don't judge me for going twice. It was amazing. <laughs> well, I guess <laughs> Houston's a good one to go to since Beyonce yeah. was born there. I'm sure that'll be a great crowd. <laughs> I'm going twice, too. Uh-huh. So don't don't feel bad. Oh great! Okay, I'm not alone in this. Uh, it was amazing talking to you all. Thank you, Jerry. Jerry, yeah. thank you so me. much. Good night. Oh uh, no! Re- from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys. Good night. Oh, absolutely. Aww. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night, dear. Very sweet. Very sweet, Jerry. Uh, I had to wow. mute myself for a bit. That, that was, was serious. Yeah, that was, I, that I, was hard. Uh, gosh. That was serious, but I'm glad. I'm glad we brought him on. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Totally. I just want to say, like, our listeners are such good people, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. better people than we are, <laughs> I think. Like, well, I just I listen yourself, to them. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, speak for yourself, bitch. I just like, I just listen to them and I just, I marvel at just yeah. how fucking incredible you all are. I completely mm-hmm. agree. I completely agree. All right, one more here. We have Haley. Hello? Hey, Haley, it's Elisa with Millennial. How are you? I'm all right. How are you guys? Good, good. Doing okay. Doing okay. Yeah. Doing okay. Um, a lot. <laughs> we wanted to, you know, as, as you know, we wanted to call and get your thoughts on, you know, all the horrific mess that's been happening in Orlando the past few days. So, you know, whatever's on your mind or whatever you, you want to say, um, whatever's going to help you most sort of get this, you know, off your chest, like tell us how you feel and what you've been going through. Um, well, um, I kind of woke up to the news on Sunday and at first just saw it was another mass shooting and kind of brushed off, which is really pathetic and awful, um, that we're at that point. <laughs> um, but as I started like noticing throughout the day what more and more information um i kind of just kept dissociating i guess um i just felt more and more out of it throughout the day and my partner did as well um i which i guess is mostly just a coping mechanism Mm -hmm. um but yeah it was it was not a great day i was also moving so it was just a bad day in general but (laughs) (laughs) yeah moving sucks yeah um so yeah, it's just been it's been a really rough couple of days um as a queer person. Um it's kind of just the thing that no one wants to talk about but everyone's talking about. Mm-hmm. Um do you guys have any specific questions for me or should I just ramble? Um well, <laughs> whatever I, you want. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's 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 really, <laughs> you know, is there 
yeah, is, are there any any topics that you feel that you need to express or well, you... oh, for sure. <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, um, no, you got, okay. You, so, you <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, so I did want to, there were a couple of things I wanted to touch on, um, when I figured I'd talk about this. Um, so one of the things is I've had a lot of people asking me if I feel unsafe now. Um, and I saw this post on Facebook that like really summed up that it's not a new thing for queer people to feel unsafe. Mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of just a, like, so for example, I'm queer and my partner's transgender. Um, and so even if we are in a, like, in a great place, um, unless it's like a pride event, we are pretty much always checking to make sure that there's no one around that's going to possibly pick up on the fact that we're queer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so this, this is not, it's not a new feeling. It's just one that had kind of subsided for a while. So. It feels really crappy to go back to that. Um, did did you mention? And then where, one of the sorry, did you mention where you live? Oh, I live in Louisville, Kentucky. Okay. Oh, okay. So how <laughs> how is it? Is so it's I get it. Actually, <laughs> we know somebody who spoke very highly of the gay community there a while ago. Well, is it is it good there? Yes, it's actually really great. Um, Louisville is it's a big city, but it's also. Um, it feels like a small town, especially with the queer community, because everyone knows each other. Um, oh, that's, that's I really nice. love it here. Good. Did you grow up there? Yeah. No, I'm from Indianapolis. Okay. Mm, so okay. sorry, you were saying something else. Um, no, you're fine. Um, I'm at work right now, so I need to make this quick. Um, okay. But uh, one thing I did notice, uh, there are two things I wanted to, to note for the listeners and everything. Um, so one of the things is that... Um, most of the victims in the shooting were people of color, um, which is not something that I've seen a lot of people talking about. Um, and I think I'm a, I'm a white person. I do this as much as anybody else. I think there's a tendency to whitewash the LGBT movement and community. Um, and I think it's something that we really need to be conscious of, that there's not only this element of of bigotry directed at people because of their sexual orientation or gender identity, but there's also that element of racism um, that I would argue probably had a major effect on this. Um, mm -hmm. And then the only other thing um, is that one thing that I've been really happy about is that there's been so much talk on Facebook on, on the in the media, as always, about Islam and its uh, effect on what happened. And one of the great things that I've seen that I've not seen is anyone who is from the LGBT community blaming Islam. I have not mm -hmm. seen anyone who is queer, who is trying to pin this on uh, Islamophobia, basically, mm -hmm. um, which is something that makes me really proud. It doesn't surprise me, but it makes me happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we're way um, less quick to judge way yeah, less for accepting sure. um yeah i mean i way saw more one, the, one thing on facebook <laughs> you're fine. Uh, one thing i saw on facebook was like uh there's there's going to be a lot of uh attempts to pin these two communities against each other um and make them in fight basically and it's something that i think a lot of people were worried about but fortunately mm. i haven't seen that happening at least no no all right. Well, um, and yeah, other than that, let's get rid of assault gun or assault rifles. Retweet. And, there yeah. you go. Let's do yeah. it. All right. Uh, that's what I want done. Cool. Thank you, Haley. We appreciate it. Yeah, we really do. Thank Thanks for coming for on. Talk. I I want to come to Louisville, and hang out in this this gay community, LGBT community. It sounds you fun. You should. Over there. It's really fun. Cool. Um, we've got we've got a great group of people. Um, we actually there was I wasn't able to go um, on Sunday night, but there was a vigil um, in solidarity with the victims in Orlando, um, and we actually had a couple thousand people crossing the bridge to Indiana oh, that's and awesome. meeting uh, Indiana people in the oh, middle, um, just to, oh, in remembrance. It was so really cute. beautiful. That's so cute. Uh, that's great. Cool. Yeah. All right. Have a good night. Thank All you right. again. 
You too. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Haley. Um, just to let you guys know, we did just get an email from Jerry, who was just on the show a few minutes ago, and he said that he wanted to add one thing. Um, so with your um, indulgence, I will, because I think that he made a really great point here. Um, he said, if you're in a position of power to make legitimate change in society, then I don't want to hear about your thoughts and prayers. I want legislation and pen to paper. If you aren't in a position of power and want to help, be an ally, a real ally. Write to your representatives and tell them to stop accepted campaign money from the NRA and to do something about this violence. There was a report that there were more mass shootings last night than there were days in the year. Wow. Yeah, that's true. There were 370 instances. Yeah. And we have one more today. This is Nancy. Nancy gets the final word today. Hi. How are hey, you? thanks for joining us. So we want to get your thoughts, as you know, on, on everything that's been, been happening the past couple of days, you know, the, sh- the shooting in Orlando. Um, how, how do you feel? Are you okay? And, and what would you want to say on it? Um, I guess I just want to say that this event was particularly overwhelming, not only because so many of these people were people of color, the victims, but so many of them were queer Latinxes and, you know, me sharing that identity. I know how difficult it can be navigating those two identities of being queer, of being Latinx. And I can't speak on behalf of all of those experiences, but I can speak on my own. And I know how difficult it is to find that space. I know because I've spent many years trying to overcome this internalized self-hatred of my people and my culture because I thought, you know, if they won't love me for who I am, why should I be proud of that? And it took me many years to realize that there was so much more to my culture than that. And one of the biggest ways that I found myself overcoming that was finding these small pockets within my community that I could call home, uh, these queer Latinx spaces where I f- could feel welcome, where I could love and be loved, where I didn't feel like I had to explain myself. And that's what so many of the people, especially on this night, on Latin night, at the Pulse Orlando, so many of these people were seeking that home. And so it really breaks my heart (laughs) that when these people were seeking this love, where they were seeking joy, just to dance and have fun and be with the people that they care about, that this had to happen. And really just, it really just uh, breaks my heart. It makes me question my own safety. But, you know, I don't think that we should let this one moment of hate affect the way we live our lives. Because there is so much of life to be, you know, lived and to be had and enjoyed. And that if we let this one person get in the way of that, that we won't be able to experience those moments. Uh, yeah, I guess that's all I wanted to say. Thanks for having this opportunity, guys. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. We appreciate it. Yeah, we really do. Yeah, thank you. Particularly. Thank you, guys. No, thank you, because we, you know, particularly I know that you know, the aftermath is, is still very new. It's all very raw. So um, we appreciate you coming on and, and talking about it so honestly. And uh, hopefully, hopefully listeners got a lot out of it, too. I think there are probably a lot of people who feel very similar to you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Nancy. No, thank you. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Bye. Nancy. Bye. All right. Well, glad we got to speak to several of our listeners tonight. I think that was really important. Yeah, I do, too. I think it's in, in this in this situation, it's more important that they be the ones that with the microphone, which is um, I think what the goal here was, was to to give them a voice instead of uh, us talking, uh, particularly Laura yeah. and myself. Yeah. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It was nice having us talk. <laughs> 
<laughs> so let's lighten things up a little bit. Before before this happened, Obama um appeared on the Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, and he did slow jamming the news that that popular segment on Jimmy Fallon. I thought we could listen to a little bit of it because it's really funny. Uh, um, probably the last time Obama's doing this, I would guess. Hopefully, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve as your president over the past eight years. When I first took office, our nation was facing one of the worst recessions in its history. Since then, we've added more than 14 million new jobs and lowered the unemployment rate to under 5%. Through the actions of my administration, we were able to stimulate the economy and get our country back on track. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> President Obama stimulated long-term growth. <laughs> both the public and the private sector. In 2008, the country wasn't feeling in the mood. It was too tired, stressed, said it had a headache. Barack lit some candles and got some silky satin sheets. Silky satin sheets now. Told the American people, yes, we can. Yes, we can. It's all right. He created tons of jobs for you and me. And he's got one more left for Hillary. <laughs> that goes on for a few minutes. It's 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 really good. Imagine being Jimmy Fallon and having the opportunity to do something like this. I, I just oh, think God I would hate myself. I wouldn't. No, I mean I would love to do I just wouldn't want myself to be Jimmy Fallon. Oh, I would. Um, um. <laughs> let, let's talk about the cursed child now, uh, to, to talk about something a little bit lighter in general. So, yeah, it uh, sucked. I don't know if I said this yet, but I, I was over in London and saw the first, first two performances of the show. Um, it, for anyone who doesn't know, if you've been living under a rock, this is the eighth story, the official eighth story brought to you by JK Rowling and two playwrights. It follows Harry and his son, Albus Severus, and a bunch of other characters, including Hermione, Ron, their children, Draco, his kid, Scorpius. And uh, we're actually going to be talking about spoilers. So if you if you don't want to be spoiled, then stop listening now. We'll see you next week. Goodbye. <laughs> Have a good week. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Should we outro for those people? Uh, sure. Visit MillennialShow.com. All right. Bye. 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 I'm Andrew. I'm Elisa. I'm Matt. I'm Laura. Bye. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm third, not last. I stop listening after I speak. Uh, I mean, coming up kind, on After Dark, kind of last. we will not be spoiling anything else. So listen to that. <laughs> anyway, um, so so I loved the pl- I loved being there. I loved the show. It was a great show. The problem is the story. It gets so bizarre. Um as as i put it there was there's breaking dawn level absurdity in the play and uh i know that does not bode well it it doesn't bode well i was ho- there were hints of it happening very early on in the play there were hints that it was actually scorpius who was the son of of voldemort so it kind of like that thing kind of gets you ready for it and then you find out the truth that voldemort and bellatrix fucked what? and had a child named delphi <laughs> i know right she's apparently a bird by the way yes she has wings she kind of fl- she flies no. does she have actual wings she like does. literal wings she has literal wings at the end mm-hmm. how does that happen oh, wait wait wings. what i thought he was part snake or something how does she become a fucking bird i don't know but she does Okay, I don't... I don't know this, by the way. This is all news <laughs> to me. <laughs> I did not read. I kind of wanted to find out on the show. Uh, yep. So wait, I'm, <laughs> I, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> hold the fucking phone. How, in seriousness, how and why does Delphi have wings? I don't, that is not explained in the, in the. Are you kidding me? They just give someone wings and they don't tell you why well is that I, why there's a fucking nest on the cover of the cursed child yeah yeah i would i would those wings are the wings that she on the on the low in the logo are the wings that she has so, so it's for dramatic effect is the cursed child 
visually you know when i was watching her with wings i i wasn't even th- i wasn't even really laughing at it like when you see it on stage it kind of it works so i think it was just for dramatic effect for the grand finale because it's only at the end okay so i mean i i can i can concede that there are certain things that definitely only make sense in the context of theater so certain aesthetic decisions okay but like when I heard that Draco Malfoy was running around yelling at people about how Scorpius was his son and not Voldemort's, I was like, okay, yeah, this is really bad. <laughs> yeah, and it's a shame because it's a shame because obviously there's a lot of anticipation around this. And again, I will say the magic in this play, seeing the magic on stage is actually remarkable. You wonder, how did they do that? Like, there's some really cool effects happening right before your eyes and the play is funny in a good way there's a lot of good stuff in it you will you will laugh out loud at it um okay uh, but there's a lot happening on stage too it's not boring to watch it's just this the the this uh, uh, it's the it's the voldemort and bellatrix fuck thing it's the uh all the time turning that's going on there's a hell of a lot of time turning and uh you know it just relies a lot on the on the on the past it's a lot of fan service as well wait who's time turning all of the characters by the end of it, frankly, because the they need time to basically the the basic premise is that Alba Severance, uh, uh, <laughs> there's so much <laughs> you see, <laughs> let me put on my nerd hat for a second. Amos Diggory wants to go back in time to, uh, because he hears that a time turner has recently been discovered and the ministry is holding it. So he goes to Harry and Hermione and asks that the time turner, uh, be used to go back and it's either save his son Cedric or go back in time. He wants to say, tell his son Cedric how much he loved him. Harry and Hermione say no, but Albus Severus overhears this conversation and decides because he sucks at Hogwarts and he's useless. Like he, he hasn't found his place yet at school. He wants to go back and save Cedric. He wants to basically rewrite history. Oh, oh fuck God you. He us. goes back. Of course, guess what? It doesn't go as planned. He fucks up everything. Uh, Snape never dies. Harry dies at the Battle of Hogwarts. Umbridge is the, is the menace, is not the minister. She's the, she's the headmistress of Hogwarts. Um, all these other things change. Oh, uh, Ron and Padma are fucking. Hermione is single and miserable. Um, good. So then, of course, as you can imagine, by the time you get to part, at the end of part one, everything's fucked up. But you walked out, you walk out of part one thinking like, well, obviously all this is going to be fixed. They're not going to leave Harry dead. So then there's no stakes. But I was still looking forward to part two because I was hoping there were going to be some big changes to the story. And all it was was a dream. No, uh, that the, the, the big the big thing at the end was that Bellatrix and Voldemort were fucking. Nobody died. Nobody significant died. The only death is one new character who you, who you never met before. And I'm not counting Delphi in that. So. And she's a bird. <laughs> and she's a bird. So, like, I just... What really shocks me about all of this is time turners have presented significant problems for her in the past in terms of people, you know, being like, well, why couldn't they just go back in time and stop Voldemort from killing Harry's parents? Problem solved. And so she has had to kind of tiptoe around this whole issue of the plot hole that is time turners. And I think that because of that, she understandably destroyed all of them in the fifth book remember in the department of mysteries they all got smashed and it was like well we can't use time turners anymore right and she should have just like not right so (laughs) so that's a great point and and in the play it's a big deal that a time turner was recently discovered and guess what after that first time turner gets recaptured or goes missing again whatever in the cursed child another time turner shows up it's just way too convenient. Wait, which one was the one that Hermione had? Uh, that was the original one that shows up in the then Christ how child. did it... I can't remember exactly did how Did someone was... find out that Hermione had it? Yeah, it came out somehow. It Look, I, I sat through five hours of this. It's, it's all a lot of information. I'm going to need to read the script again before I get it all oh straight my in my God. head. So is the main <laughs> character uh, Albus Severus? It, it's Dumbledore, actually... Dumbledore, fuck me, name? Al, it's uh, Alba Severus, Harry, Ron, Hermione. They're all pretty prominent. As is Scorpius. Scorpius is actually really fantastic in this play. As is Hermione. 
And again, it's fun to watch. I'm just worried about how it will read. This sounds read like well. uh, this sounds this, like a fanfic. This sounds ruinous. This sounds this sounds so terrible. This this does sound like fan fiction. In fact, I'm pretty sure I moderated this back in 2006. <laughs> yeah. I would bet a lot of money that I rejected this actually from the queue and with a good fucking reason. And one of those reasons might be that I, none of this seems to me to be consistent with how time turners are even supposed to work. Or just the Harry Potter series in general. Well, that too. All right. We'll, we'll get to how much they... S- they seem to have butchered the characters, but even plot wise, like that's not how time turns were presented. Like there, they have, there's rules for this shit. People, we live in a society. There has to be rules and they were laid out very clearly. I thought, and it wasn't so much. Laura and I talked a little bit about this. It wasn't so much that when you use a time turner, you could change the past. It was more that you were sort of living it simultaneously with the current timeline. And so those things had already happened or they were predestined to happen or whatever. You know, so like it's a closed loop. Exactly. It's a closed loop. So, you know, when Harry thinks he sees his father saving him from the Dementor's kiss, it's obviously not really his father. He realizes it was him all along, yada, yada. The key being there, it was him all along. Like, it wasn't like he went back and changed it. Like, it was simultaneous with what we were seeing in real time. So, but that's not what was happening here. So this seems to me like a massive, massive failure on a story, on a narrative level. I think so. In fairness to that point, Albus Severus, he's young. He doesn't realize the trouble he's getting into. But as a viewer, you're watching this and you obviously know that this is not going to work out well. And there's just so much focus on Goblet of Fire. Nobody would have ever guessed I'll give them credit. Nobody saw this whole story coming. Um, uh, The story focuses so much on Goblet of Fire that it's like you're kind of reliving that story because they they revisit all three tasks in the Triwizard Tournament, which, by the way, wasn't even most people's favorite books. I think J.K. Rowling herself said it was the one she rushed and she wished she didn't rush it. So to revisit it seems really bizarre. Well, now we really fucking hate it. <laughs> yeah. I, I am genuinely very curious to see how people interpret this story because, because again, it, it is good to watch. It is a good afternoon at the theater, but, but that's it. And, and it, I wish it advanced the story, but it doesn't. It seems to detract from the story. Yeah. It just seemed frankly. like it was just a bad day. Yeah. It's. Exactly. Aldous it's a, Severus and the no good, very bad day. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, well, like it's a self-contained before, story. It all really sounds sounds just like the fourth Shrek movie. Yeah. <laughs> the, Where the, he just goes back in time and everything is changed. And now he has to like, f- like put everything back together again. Like we've seen this done many times. Yeah. It's like some alternate universe right bullshit i'm just i'm not happy with it elisa i'm expecting (laughs) i'm expecting mcgonagall to like come out with (laughs) with a turkey leg and you yeah yeah (laughs) me too is it a a turkey well laura's referencing the fact that we literally had to read a whole fucking story about mcgonagall masturbating with a turkey leg back when we were when we were Harry, when we were fan fiction moderators on MuggleNet, we literally, we had to read this story. It was our job. It was as disgusting as it sounds. I distinctly remember the word sinewy being thrown around way too many times. And I think <laughs> oh it was also my God. the same. <laughs> it was also the same week. It was also the same week that, um, we got, oh God, what was it? The hamster. <laughs> oh, the Ron hamster story. It was Ron, Ron likes to insert small rodents in his anus. I have to tell you, I feel like that's a better story than Cursed Child. <laughs> wow. I feel like there is, I would pay a well, yeah, because lot because there was loss. A lot of fucking money to see Rupert Grant up on stage putting a hamster in his butt. That would, <laughs> I would pay for that. This I would not pay for. Whatever the fuck abomination came out of of this shit you couldn't pay me to 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 watch that i don't understand at all i don't get like ptsd to those fan fiction moderating days these are some dark times guys the other drama coming out of this play is the wormtaily thing now what happened was um 
on Hypable, we published two articles, no, completely not spoiling anything in the headlines. One was about the Hogwarts houses that Albus, Scorpius, and Rose went into. And the other one was about Hermione's new job. But we didn't even mention new job in the headline. We just said there's something delightfully new about Hermione and the Cursed Child. Yeah. So you were not spoiled in any way unless you actually clicked on these. And it then was, it was almost like clickbaity, even so, like, so it didn't spoil anything. So then exactly. That's exactly why I wrote it that way. And then so the next morning I wake up to my friend Richard going, Oh no. And I'm like, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> he reads me the tweet and i was at first very scared because i thought people were going to be turning against us and siding with jk rowling on this she tweeted something to to the effect of if you don't want any cursed child spoilers avoid avoid hypable but as the day went on it actually turned out that most people were on our side and we definitely caught some shit from people somebody some some people do agree with her and that's fine but it was a relief to see that most people thought that we were in the right. And I know you guys had thoughts on it, too. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. Honestly, like knowing knowing what the real spoilers are, Andrew, you did a, a public service <laughs> right. to get people. Like, yeah. She, I'm just like, sharing the no, good stuff. Spoiler free. Like, no. Fuck, it doesn't even matter because the spoilers don't even happen. Like, it was all a dream. Exactly. Like, yeah, right. When we got to the end of the play, I was like, what can we even spoil? We Even if we wanted to, we couldn't because all of it gets reversed. <laughs> um, maybe they're afraid that if people know, like, they're not going to waste their money seeing it. Or yeah, that actually... It. After J.K. Rowling tweeted that, you know, if you don't want to be spoiled, avoid hypeable... Matt was like, and we, we tweeted this out, actually. Matt said, well, if you don't want Harry Potter spoiled, avoid Cursed Child. <laughs> <laughs> Which I really think sums it up so fucking well. Yeah. That does. I still do not get why she singled you out. I mean, listen, I love J.K. Rowling. She will always be my I queen. But like, <laughs> But, like, I just, I don't understand why she singled you out like that. I, I have one did theory. She, did she even read the articles like, i don't know i have one theory and it's getting back to what matt just said she was actually pointing people our way in a subtle way because the real bad spoilers were on tumblr reddit and uh, meanwhile the daily beast a day or two later posted posted a full-blown summary in their own words about the play um so they were direct she was directing people to us so she people looked at those spoilers because she also tagged typable I mean, she may as but, well have put a hyperlink right there too. But a lot of a lot of the replies, though, to the tweet were people saying like "awesome," blocking them, or or whatever. So and there were also people who said, "Cool, now I know where to look." <laughs> yeah, I, I also saw some fucking douche nozzle on there who was like, "Andrew Sims basically owes his career to Harry Potter." What a <laughs> fucker! How could how could he betray J.K. Rowling? But it's like, yeah. I didn't sign an NDA. Free speech, bitches. I can write what I want. Yeah, just because you got a fucking pin doesn't mean that you are forbidden. Yeah, that wasn't a contract. There is Fuck no the way. It is so unrealistic to expect that there would be zero spoilers. I think the best you can hope for and the responsible thing to do is exactly what Hypable did, which was to clearly mark there are spoilers within. That's the best you can hope for. Right. Like that's the I don't I don't know what else she expected. I I love Joe too. I love Joe too, but I think she was being a little bit of a princess about that whole thing. Yeah. Me and by the way, thank you to the millennial listeners who were supportive. It it actually helped a lot when I was initially very nervous about the reaction. There was a lot of talk in the Facebook group and almost everybody was on our side, so that was good. Meanwhile, I walk into part two, they're fucking selling the shirt with a part two end of part one spoiler right on it. What it, what was the spoiler? It 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 it's the Voldemort Day logo. At the at the end of part one, when Albus Scor- Albus and Scorpius have fucked everything up, Umbridge is running Hogwarts, and they have Voldemort Day because Voldemort is alive. He never died, so they have this Voldemort Day to celebrate him. And so the Vold- there's this Voldemort Day logo, and you could buy a shirt with that when you walked into part two. Is uh, is Voldemort actually in the play? Yes, at the end. Does he does he make all the stupid sound effects that Ray Fiennes made in the movies? 
Does um, he like walk across the stage and go, eh? I think Scorpius. he makes some weird noises. Harry okay. also turns into yeah! Voldemort to trick out like Delphi. And I'm not sure what? if it was Polyjuice Potion. I can't remember, but. Why? To, to, uh, to, to lure know. him. Because Delphi wants to meet her father. And then at the end of the play, Harry's like, you have to deal with being an orphan, Delphi, just like I did. Go suck a dick. <laughs> and then. Then, All was well. By the way, <laughs> Scar. One final thing: J.K. Rowling missed a major opportunity to introduce Albus, or to introduce a gay character or a couple in this. Albus and Scorpius were seriously, really being set up to be more than friends in this thing. There's this one sequence when they're kind of dancing around each other on on separate stair- staircases when their relationship is on the rocks, and. I was just like <laughs> so expecting to, for those two to get together by the end of it, and and you know J.K. Rowling is very supportive of the LGBT community, and yet she wedged in the Dumbledore being gay thing. Now here's an eighth story. Make fucking fans excited. Put in something good yeah. that we can Don't get worry. behind. There will be fan fiction about it, and then they'll make a play about that too. Right, exactly. <laughs> in like another ten years, there's going to be another play about how Scorpius and Albus get together. But then at the very end, Harry's going to wake up and he's going to still be in the cupboard under the stairs. <laughs> I hope what happens in the next play is that Albus and Scorpius get together, and then Harry's like, "LOL, fuck you." Grabs a time turner, goes back in time, and fucks up their whole relationship, and then laughs off into the sunset. I, I just decided I'm going to write my own Albus Scorpius fan fiction. Yeah, I need to Harry get this Potter out. and the Gay Son. <laughs> Harry will go back in time and give them a blanket. I want. I do want to clarify one thing, though. Just a genuine curiosity. This. This story was not J.K. Rowling wrote the story, but the idea wasn't hers. Is that right? That is right. So people came to her with this idea and she signed off on it. Now, the question is, how much of this was somebody else's idea? How how much of this was hers? Because some of this surely must have been hers. I have to wonder, though. Would the Voldemort Bellatrix thing really have been hers? Would she sit on this for so long after Deathly Hallows? Well, okay. First of all, who, when we say somebody or people went to her with the idea, who exactly? The people who, so on, on, um, let me look up their names. Cause when you buy the script book, John Tiffany and Jack Thorne. So the script book says JK Rowling biggest and then underneath John Tiffany and Jack Thorne, a new play so by it's... Jack Thorne. It's their okay, so it's their play. Like I'm sure J.K. Rowling signed off on it because in the end, really nothing, n- nothing really mattered. Like n- all the things that happened got fixed. So I do. Was... Re- Go ahead. I'm sorry, Matt. I-, I was gonna say I do remember in the books. I think it might have been Order of the Phoenix. There's some part where J.K. Rowling where it describes the way that Bellatrix looks at Voldemort, and it says specifically looks at him like a lover or something along yes. those lines. Oh yeah, she was definitely I, in love with him. She yeah, was, I do remember reading that. I just I didn't I didn't take that literally, however. Yeah. Well here's the funny thing. So we ha- we found a f- thread on Reddit from nine months ago. Somebody predicted that the child of Voldemort and Bellatrix was the cursed child. And she references this person on Reddit references what you just said, Elisa, that Bellatrix uh, talk to Voldemort as a lover. Hmm. And her death is the only time Voldemort is upset at someone's death. It's another thing I'm going to write about. I'm going to go back and reread and find all the clues about yeah. Bellatrix. You don't see that in the movie. <laughs> Speaking of which, some of our um, listeners started a Facebook chat, yes. which I'm sure they'll invite you to if you expressed interest in joining. Um, and they photoshopped what the child of bellatrix and voldemort would look like what and it became kind of a trend in the chat where if any time somebody said delphi somebody else would send this picture <laughs> and it's it's really great I'm i need to find can, this I, i'm maybe we can make it our album art this the, the 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 group chat name is hashtag fuck the secrets, fuck the secrets. <laughs> i took a snapchat of one of my cursed child tickets because it says keep hashtag keep the secrets on it and I crossed mm-hmm. out keep and I wrote fuck on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so 
that's that. That is the cursed child. <laughs> I'm We're genuinely um, curious. I hope you all read the script book because I want to hear your thoughts, and I'm looking forward to. Um, how many pages well. is it? It's it's uh, I don't know how many pages. I don't think average too long. average fan fiction length. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna go perusing through Mugglenet fan fiction archives for this. I know it's in there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, to wrap up to the show today, a couple of reminders here. First of all, don't forget to visit our website, millennialshow.com. You can listen to all of our episodes, get show notes, access the bonus content that we do on Patreon. Patreon.com slash millennial is where you can pledge. We really appreciate your support. We're doing bonus content each and every week. Um, we are also doing the bonus vlog blog. I'm going to be recording mine on my London trip soon. You can also be entered to participate in Surprise Bitch, and like I said, lots of other bonus material on there. And uh, anything else we want to plug this week? No. Mm. no. Actually, we're going to be meeting soon to figure out our physical, our oh, the next gift we're sending out to our $10 patrons, right? Yes. Our top supporters, which is very exciting. Yes. So to uh, close us out, we are going to shift gears again. I, this is important for everybody to listen to. Um, it's hard to listen to, but it's important. It's a somber reminder. Uh, on Monday night, Anderson Cooper was live in Orlando, and he read the names of every victim of the shooting and also said a little thing about that person so we could get to know each of them. And uh, it, it's it's important to listen to because it makes you remember what what happened here the the lives that were lost the number of lives that were lost and and uh, that they weren't and as anderson himself says that they they're they're not just they're not just figures or numbers or statistics that they're real people um so difficult to hear but important to hear Mm-hmm. On After Dark today, we are going to uh, be playing uh, one of our regular games, and we are also going to be talking about a uh, little more about the Cursed Child and if authors should continue to write material after they they were supposedly finished with it. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I'm Andrew. I'm Elisa. I'm Laura. And I'm Matt. See you next week for 224. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. There are more than a, a list of names. There are people who loved and were loved. There are people with families and friends and dreams. And the truth is, we don't know much about some of them. We want you to hear their names and a little bit about who they were. Edward Sotomayor, Jr. He worked at a travel agency that catered to the gay community. His family says he was witty, charming. And that he always left things better than he found them. He was 34 years old. Stanley Almodovar III, he was a pharmacy technician. He was the last video that we saw of him was posted on social media that showed him laughing and singing on the way to that nightclub. He was just 23. Luis Omar Ocasio Capo, he was a dancer and a barista. He was just 20 years old. Luis Vielma, he worked at the Harry Potter ride at Universal Orlando. He was just 22. Juan Ramon Guerrero, his cousin said Juan came out to his family just this year and was afraid they might not accept him, but they did, and they embraced his boyfriend as well. He was 22. Christopher Andrew Leonone, known as Drew, he was um, Juan's boyfriend, and his mom says he established the Gay Straight Alliance at his high school. He was 32 years old. Eric Ivan Ortiz Rivera, a friend says he was always willing to help everybody and sacrificed a lot for his family. He was 36. Peter O. Gonzalez Cruz, he worked at a UPS store, memorized apparently all the regular customers' names. He could make anyone smile, his friend said. He was just 22. Kimberly K.J. Morris moved from Hawaii to Florida just a few months ago to help her mother and her grandmother. She was a bouncer at Pulse Nightclub. She was 37. Eddie Justice was an accountant who texted his mother from the club, texted his mother saying, Mommy, I love you. He was 30. Enrique Rios, a friend says he was cool and a funny dude who could tell, tell people, don't let the world hold you back from your dreams. He was 25. Anthony Luis Loriano Dizla, a 
talented dancer born in Puerto Rico. He was 25. Jonathan Antonio Camui Vega. He worked for Telemundo, first in Puerto Rico and then in Orlando. He was just about to turn 25. Corey James Connell was a student at Valencia Community College and hoped to become a firefighter. He was 21. Mercedes Marisol Flores, her father says she was a happy girl who had so many dreams. She was 26. Dianca Deirdre Drayden, her family called her Didi. She was a bartender at Pulse. She was just 32. Miguel Angel Honorato managed a Mexican restaurant. A colleague says he was an excellent boss and a good friend. He was 30. Jason Benjamin Joseph had a student at Southern Technical College where a faculty member calls him a sweet kid with a bright future. He was 19. Daryl Roman Burt II was a financial aid officer at Kaiser University, he was passionate about volunteer work. He was 29. Jean Carlos Mendez Perez was a perfume salesman. Apparently he hit the gym almost every day and his friends said he was always happy. He was 35. Perez's longtime partner, Luis Daniel Wilson Leon, grew up in a small town in Puerto Rico and was a shoe store manager. He was 37. They died together. Frankie Jimmy de Jesus Velasquez, a professional dancer specializing in a traditional folk dance of his native Puerto Rico, he was 50. Amanda Alviar, she was a nursing student at the University of South Florida, was 25. Martin Benitez Torres, he was a college student in Puerto Rico, visiting family in Orlando, he was 33. Juan Chavez Martinez, his co-workers at a hotel say he was a kind, a loving person, he was just 25. Gerald Arthur Wright worked at Disney World. The co-worker says he was wonderful with the guests. He was always smiling. He was 31. Leroy Valentin Fernandez worked leasing apartments. A co-worker says he sang Adele in the office until they couldn't take it anymore. He was 25. Tevin Eugene Crosby, dedicated, hardworking business owner from Michigan. He was just 25. Brenda Lee Marquez McCool. She had 11 kids, beat cancer twice, and often went dancing at Pulse with her gay son. She supported him that much. She was 49. Her son survived the shooting. Angel L. Candelario Padro recently moved to Orlando. He was new here. He had just started a new job as a technician at the Florida Retina Institute. He was 28. Gilberto Ramon Silva Menendez was studying health care management. His family says that he was the light and life of all family gatherings. He was 25. Javier Jorge Reyes was a salesman at Gucci. Friends say he was always positive. He was humble, a lovely friend. He was 40. Shane Evan Tomlinson was a gifted singer who performed at weddings and clubs. He was 33. Simone Adrian Carrillo Fernandez worked at McDonald's where he brought in birthday cakes for his co-workers and had just gotten back from a trip to Niagara Falls with his partner. He was 31. Oscar Aracena Montero was a Simon's partner. He was 26. They also died together. Rodolfo Ayala. Ayala worked at a blood donation center, was a Puerto Rican native, loved to dance. He was 33 years old. Frank Hernandez, he worked at a Calvin Klein store, was a great brother and had love, had no gender tattooed on his arm. He was 27. Xavier Emmanuel Serrano Rosado was a dancer, described as hardworking and friendly, pr proud of his son. He was 33. Akira Monet Murray, she recently graduated from high school, was planning to go to Mercyhurst University and play basketball. She was just 18. And Christopher Joseph Sanfeliz worked at a bank, was said to be the most positive guy around, was just 24 year olds. Luis Daniel Conde was a makeup artist, co owned a salon with his partner, he was 39. Juan P. Rivera Velasquez. He was the uh, partner to Luis. He was 37. Antonio Devon Brown was a captain in the uh, excuse me was a captain in the U.S. Army Reserve and a graduate of Florida A&M. He was 29. Alejandro Barrios Martinez was 21. Joel Rayon Paniagua was 32. Jean Neves Rodriguez was 27. We don't have pictures of these people. Gil Marie Rodriguez Sullivan was 24, and Paul Terrell Henry was 41 years old. We think it's important that you hear their names.